Okay, um, I don't like a word lecture actually because I don't do lectures in the university. I don't think this is the way to learn anything. So whenever you feel some to say something to to say, so it's more like what do they call alustus, you know, introduction to the subject. But I, I have no idea how much you know already. Probably quite a lot. So I need feedback from you. Um, so th that was originally about food systems if we go back yeah food production but i really wanted to focus at at primary production because we know from experience that this is where most of environmental impact really come from of course there is transportation and waste but what happens on the farm level is is the main okay you're nodding you know good so let's go on uh, just to remind you, when we speak about environmental impacts, I mean, this is something humans do to the environments. It's not about elephants trampling, it's about human impact on the environment. So there is immediately that separation. And in economic terms, we speak about externalities. So so it's actually something for which a person who... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. Um, I have a point actually somewhere. Never mind. But it's something that you do for good or for bad, but you don't pay it. From some else pays, either another person or group in society or other species. You know, so that's a very important to remember. Environment is not a subject. It's not a group of people. It's not legal entity. So it's kind of doesn't it accept any pain. So, and that creates a lot of um, problems, but externality can be also positive and agriculture does have very, some positive also environmental uh, benefits of which I will mention some. And of course it can be on both level of production and consumption, but I want to look at production, but it will eventually of course always come to consumption. So, and then it, because nobody pays, it doesn't mean that nobody pays, somebody actually pays sooner or later either another person who is affected by polluted water, for example, or another group of people who are affected, or then other species, of course, can be affected. So um, just to remind, again, environment is a public good, so we don't pay for, for using it. So if, if the same water is in the lake, you use it without paying. If it's bottled up, then it's already a product, and that is private already paid. But environment is not for sale as such. Uh, but of course, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. It has a considerable value, but it has no cost on the market. And something that when I teach on biodiversity uh, and agriculture, I uh, give these citations to my students in asking them to think of the reasons why it is so. I mean, we, we can't like really speak of conservation if we don't speak about agriculture. And you probably know why. So, <laughs> why? <laughs> yes, it's, you know, forestry, fishery, everything is important. Mining, energy production, but agriculture is paramountly important. Yeah, but just showed up. We're not in the lecture hall. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, but it's often forgotten, forgotten it's exceptionally in a country like Finland, where agriculture is in short supply. It's so much forest, but actually it's like 25% of the terrestrial surface. Everything that can be converted in agriculture is already there, except some tropical regions. So it's a huge area. And the impacts, of course, originate then within agriculture. So farmland is being affected by farming, but also impacts go into other habitats, all of them, like pollutants, DDTs found in uh, meat of penguins, you know, or, or climate change is affecting everything. Um, so, but there are many impacts from agriculture, but I think it's useful to think of them in two ways. Either we take resources from the environment for food production, and that can be water, energy, soil fertility as a resource. We are using it up. Okay, it's renewable, but it's been also used up. Uh, land, which is in short supply, or, th or then we put something back to the environment, which can be pollution, then waste, it can be pesticides. You know, uh, it can be 
again, pollution of water, soils, airs, or than our own bodies. So either we're taking too much and then we're putting too much in the wrong place of the wrong kind. All right, I guess that much. Again, an interesting thing that uh, I would like you to remember about this private and public, you know, arable land in many parts of the world is private property. I myself now, a landowner, I kind of own the land, which is quite a different thing to, for me to think how one can own something. <laughs> but soil fertility, who owns that? I don't know the word arable. Arable. Tillable? Tillable? Um, so it's the, the peeled, cultivated, yeah, tilled, more. Yeah, the, the one that can be. Yeah, well, do ask me for specific questions, of course. Thank you. So we own it, but then soil fertility, this is a resource that's been, you know, very slowly accumulating over millennia previously. Who owns that? Is it the farmer? Is it the society at large? So who is responsible for actually maintaining it as a resource? And then, of course, land use. I mean, land is in short supply. It's what is there on the earth, as Mark Twain 100 years ago already said, you know, invest, invest into land, they stop producing it. The land is what it is, and we take it into our production of food, so we take it from some other species. Uh, and as I said, I mean, cost, we, nobody pays for it. We don't pay for using land. We don't pay for using fertility, for water in many cases. But actually, somebody else pays, and the cost for, to the society is considerable. This is something calculated for the UK already 20 years ago. And, you know, don't look at all the figures, but the the social cost, the total social cost is 2.3 billion. Uh, billion uh, pounds. So it's not a trifle. It's quite a big money we're speaking. Actually, if you relate it to the sort of the, the wealth of food produced monitoring the UK, so it's one extra pound is being paid by the society for producing one pound of food. So all of us pay double at least for food that we buy in the shop. And that was quite a low old study, but here is a new one that is by by the American consultancy firm for the for, for Germany and the, the, the calculation they made up was staggering. It's not anymore two billion, it's one hundred billion for food production. This is unaccountable cost that the societies pay in terms of pollution, climate, you know, change climate, loss of biodiversity, um, I guess, animal welfare. So ecology, I guess this is biodiversity. And then in black, this is subsidies. So the, 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 the actual cost to the society is immense. So food doesn't come cheaply. It's an illusion made by the current market system. Now, the reasons for it. Now, there are many reasons, of course, and there's too little time to talk about it. First, of course, because there is so much of agriculture already, so that's why the impact is so horrendous. And then there's still more agriculture being made from the tropical forest mainly and mangrove forests, but um, uh, so this is an ongoing process still, and it mainly comes <coughs> this one world in data, um, one, one our world in data. By the way, it's a very good source. I don't know if you know it, but very good graphics and information collected from research articles. It's not from the silly, so to speak. So it's based on, on research, and that's where the, the land is being still carved to farmland to produce food. And you will see this is mainly what? Deforestation? That's beef. That's oilseed, farm oil, and soybean mainly. So forestry, bad guy forestry comes only third in this 
So this is where the impacts come. Of course, cereals also make an impact, but as you can see, it's quite marginal. So we're still uh, converting the land into agriculture, and that's a big impact. And then, of course, there is impact within agricultural lands because we are losing soil fertility. We are still polluting waters, even within agriculture, and biodiversity is declining. And I have one anecdotal uh, example for it. <clears throat> uh, it's not published as a scientific paper, but it's a known one. I can relate to it because I grew up in the Soviet uh, Union myself and I know how it can happen. So in the 50s, under the communist regime, Mao Zedong um, designed with his uh, government designed uh, a pest control program to eradicate three species. It was cockroaches, I think rats, and tree sparrow, the small bird that is also lives in Finland, um, Varkonen. So they, um, they like organized nine million persons years of prosecuting this bill. So basically all school children, everybody was made, made to kill those birds in any possible ways, just to get rid of it full stop because it ate too much grain. These birds eat grain. So, I mean, you're shaking your heads, but I can understand the societies like that can really organize such campaigns. But the thing is that, okay, three years they were doing it, uh, the birds declined and then the crops failed because those birds feed their chicks with uh, insects and many of those insects are, pest, are pests. So without that control by birds, the, the crop was disseminated because of core borer. So they stopped this campaign and birds like rebounded. It. It's a very, you know, has many chicks, so just population went back quite quickly. The same species, the very same species in the UK declined 70% without any persecution. So it's something very dramatic happened within the habitat of that bird, like which is farmland mainly. And it, it's still like this, and in many countries such birds and farmland and insects are still declining. So within farming itself, there is a lot of still loss of biodiversity and resources. Uh, am I speaking too fast? No? No, catching, good. Now, but having said this, <clears throat> it's declining, but then farmland is still a very important biodiversity habitat. And that's often we forget. We think of forests, wetlands, but actually, on the European scale, for example, farmland is more important for biodiversity because it's been like 10,000 years in some places. Okay, in Finland it's less, in most Europe six perhaps thousand years. For that time of space, very slow development, many species could adapt. The, the, the really fast developments became after the Second World War with mechanization and chemicals. But before that, for thousands of years, it was very extensive and species just adapted and started to use farmland. And I, I put here several of the things like in the European, Euro, like Europe, yes. More species of birds use farmland as their habitat now than they use forests. So what is happening within farmland is also important. In Finland, again, 7% of the area is farmland. And there's some data that show 30% of species in some ways use it. And some of them are totally dependent on it because there is no natural habitat for them to go to. Uh, but then important again to remember that most of that biodiversity is associated with not just cereal field or potato field, but something that we call semi-natural grasslands. It's in Finland would be like perine biotop. It's polylon, tiny nurni, lydon mice, for example. So it's something that is not tilled regularly, not used very intensively, something that is fairly marginal. That's where most of our biodiversity is. So whenever, you know, you hear that farmland is important for biodiversity, it's not all of it. And and where is and what kind of farmland it is? Uh, I'll just show you 
couple of pictures. So if we imagine this is an intensive kind of cropland, it could be also grassland, and this is natural steppe. In Europe, we don't have any natural steppe. I mean, the last plot is in Ukraine now, heavily bombed in south of Ukraine. But beside that, there are quite many such habitats that like coastal areas that is very extensively grazed, hay meadows, like this wooded hay meadow in Estonia, Alps, of course, uh, heather, Atlantic heather, again, very interesting habitat, very biodiverse. You know, here, again, you can't plow this, it's, cal it's calcium, it's rock. You can graze it, and it's biodiversity-wise, it's absolutely fantastic and diverse. West Island, again, Montada and Dessa, wood pastures, high combination of crops and pasture and trees, immensely biodiversity, rich and cultural, and Pushta in Hungary. So this is where most of our biodiversity, but this is not where most of our food comes from these days, of course. That's very important to remember. Um, uh, so this is like European Union, and there are some estimates that put this we call it high nature value farmland. They put that one third of all European land can be high importance for biodiversity. But as you can see on this map, it's like on the fringes. It's not the most producing intensive fertile lands. It's mountains, it's again coastal areas, very little left in Finland, Pyrenees. So this is where our biodiversity is, not necessarily on most of the fields. And you know quite a lot about it. <laughs> uh, so, and this biodiversity is also very endangered now. It's really threatened, like one third of um, what butterflies, grasshoppers, they're declining, endangered plants, like, was it 60% will be, maybe more, 70? Of all red data, endangered species of plants in Germany are from those agricultural grasslands, but they're semi-natural. Uh, so there are many endangered things. So you have, on one hand, very high diversity in certain types of farmlands and very high risk of extinction. So yeah, farmland is important also. It's not only tropical forests, but specific type of farmland. And many Finns never seen that because it became just so rare now in Finland. Um, again, now I can't see time because I can't see it here also. Yeah, 20. Yeah, I can see it here. Good. Now, again, the reason, reason again, we, we're just taking too much resources from the environment for our food production. That's the main reason. And something can be useful for you to appreciate something we call human appropriation of net primary productivity. So. This is basically biomass that's being produced by, by you know, vegetation, let's say. And then the percentage of each that is taken by humans. Right? So the totality of biomass being produced and then how much indirectly or directly we use. And as you can see, in percentage-wise, in some parts of the world, it can be 60, 80, even 100 percent, like India some very densely populated countries, the, the Benelux. So this is where most of our farmland is also. Basically everything that is grown is being taken by humans. That's why there is such an impact. The more you take for one species, the less there is for other species. And that's quite simple, I guess, to visualize this or understand this kind of consumption and this is a study which was published and popularized quite a lot some years ago and um, this is guardian who made a picture out of it but probably you've seen some other maybe illustration of it uh, the, the study basically estimated the biomass of mammals and birds on this planet and once they did it they realized that the whole biomass of all wild mammals on this planet is now 4%. That's elephants and mice and hedgehogs all combined. 36% of humans were very big species. And even more, 
our domesticated animals. Cows, sheep, goats. I don't know if they count dogs and cats into it. But yeah, that's our planet. That's our food production. And for birds, it's also like 30 to 70. This is turkey, duck, chicken. That's a planet we created, yeah. And that's again, it's an illustration of how resources been removed from one part of the ecosystem to uh, another. So we are very hungry, big species. So wh where do these resources go? So we take them from elephants and we put them into our mouths. Uh, but in terms of production, it goes two ways, whether eat ourselves or we eat indirectly through Again, okay, animals, fish also, farmed fish, aquaculture. So there are two ways we eat this. And I will use Finland as an example, but it's typical for many countries of so-called developed world. Industrial agriculture, that's the cereal used in Finland. We try barley oats, there's also Finnish original. So this is what is seeded then for next year. This is put into food, like porridge bread this is used as beer mainly and this is what goes as a feed so in this country basically there's no arable production as such it's a very very minor slice because most of cereals that are grown in this country is part of uh, animal livestock production system because it ends up there and only then comes to our table Um, as I say, it's quite typical for many other countries. This is where the resources go. And this is uh, an assessment, again, very much um, we've got quite a lot of publicity published a few years ago in Science, top research journal. Um, they reviewed Joseph Poore, um, so reviewed like 500 databases across the world for 40 different products of life cycle assessment. So the impacts across the whole production cycle of say bread or beer or oh, peas and fish, yaks, etc. And the only really important thing you can see from it is if you calculate, so the calculated greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and land use are uh, for 100 grams of protein. And you will see that beef, lamb, mutton, again, dairy, herd beef, it's by far the largest producer of the emissions and use of land. So <clears throat> important here, you see the scale. So the, here's a 0, 25, 50, but here 0, 5, 10. So here where it goes. Uh, so if we look at the land use, uh, let's say, so the most... Lamb and Martin uses 200 million uh, square meters per year. Sorry, not million, square meters per year. Yeah, 100 is. So if we compare with, say, eggs, it will be only five. So 20 times higher use. That's how you interpret it. And if we look at like peas or tofu, perhaps. So here we have maybe two or three. So it's like nearly 100 times more than use. <clears throat> that says it all in terms of impacts. Or a lot anyway. Um, well, uh, probably I will skip this one. If you're interested, you can look at it later because uh, you have the slides. But it's a very, it's, it was published just now, this year in Nature, the journal. It's, it's a very similar results this is global accumulative environmental footprint of different foods and there's uh, all kind of foods here including fish this time but what they did they they have greenhouse gas emissions but they also put nutrients here and water use and also disturbance meaning the habit of taking from other species or loss of biodiversity that's what it means and what is important here like cattle is really bad on on greenhouse gas emissions, that's much we knew. Pigs, 
of course, are much better there. So their pink is quite smaller. Greenhouse, they're more efficient in converting food into meat. But their footprint on nutrients is appalling That's because they eat grain and food that can be eaten directly by humans, simply. So the use of nutrients that can be available for other uses is very, very high. Does that make sense? Yeah, shrimp is particularly bad on conversion of natural habitats that because of mangrove forests, I guess. Again, um, what is rice, wheat, often irrigated, while well, rice takes a lot of water and wheat is irrigated quite often. Um, well, I thought that I might stop here a little bit about this again. Livestock is such a polarized debate. There are very good reasons why we started to use cows in like 10,000 years ago and sheep. There are many good uses of it. Um, and this is, um, but it's been too polarized. There are a branch of people and also researchers <laughs> that really drive a message that it's just not about cow, but how. So it does, you know, cow is a sacred animal, we have to use it, a lot of it, as much as we have, but we just need to change how we use it. And that's a very difficult also argument because I think it's very simplified. So I don't know if, it's, if you watch the Sacred Cow movie. It's an interesting film, documentary film. It's, um, it's a useful one. If you want to do something with activism, just look, watch it and carefully, you know, stopping and Try and really understand where their arguments come and in what ways they took it, they bring it out. One of the arguments is that livestock is actually not uh, not to blame because um, they eat mostly what people can't eat. So nearly ninety percent of what they eat is not possible to eat for humans. And um, unfortunately, it's only partly true, and even if that is true, it's a very inefficient way of, nonetheless, using land. Because, again, this is a very good source of information for you if you want this, our world in data. So um, the only thing I wanted to, to, to take you here, agricultural land. So this is what is being used for animals, nearly 80%. This is used for, like, cereals. Uh, other arable crops for humans. So 70-80% of land, agricultural land, is being directly and directly used for animal production. And then in terms of calories, they bring us what? Mm, below 20%. It's extremely wasteful way of getting calories. In protein, a little bit better, 40%, but still 80 and only 40. It's just very inefficient. Even if they eat grass, it's still inefficient. And uh, according to those researchers that actually looked more in, in data, they say that it's only like 60% of, of, of grass that is used for livestock is unsuitable for crops. So a lot of grassland still is in area. Like in Finland also, it can be used for production of, say, oats for humans. But it's used for animal production. And then again, um, a lot of people that speak now about regenerative agriculture, okay, I have huge sympathy for, for those people and what they're trying to do. But I think often they lose an argument, um, or how to say, they say that we can use grassland pastures much more efficient in different ways and we will produce even more from smaller land. But if you look at the figures by FAO, 60% of agricultural land is pasture and it supplies only 10% of the world's beef. Okay, let's say with better management we can triple production of pastures. Where does 70% of beef will come from? So it still has to come from somewhere. And there's just no more land available to turn into more pastures, unless you cut forest. 
or should I ask for some study? Hmm. You can ask now. Yes, yes, of course. Generative agriculture is one of the For me it sounds this is like your I'm agreeing in, with principles of it. We need to make agriculture more regenerative by various methods. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the principles. But they make an argument that we can kind of minimize the impact of production, and in this case, livestock, by better management. So is that, that doesn't include like cutting down production of... Exactly, livestock. yeah. So with the same. Yeah, with the same. So we'll just manage. It's not cow, it's how. So we'll, we can produce the same amount of meat, protein, or dairy with just better management. And we can, by this, um, there's no land area. There's no water resources to do. We can improve. We should improve. Absolutely, yes. But there is no way that we can sustain the same production of livestock. And it's growing on. And it's also inefficient, it's still inefficient. No matter how well we manage this land, it's still inefficient. And again, uh, what is the third argument, I, I guess, which is often forgotten, that this grassland, we can't eat it, but uh, a lot of this grassland originally was not grassland. Okay, there were uh, pampas in uh, in Latin America, there were savannas and our savannas in, in 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 Africa. These are natural grasslands and prairie in the states. But a lot of grassland now, agricultural grassland, is a form of forest or wetland, like in Finland. I mean, if you look at the, in in countries like Ireland, the whole country is just green golf course with cows on it. That used to be Atlantic uh, forest. In some fringes Atlantic rainforest, extremely biodiversity rich, and in other parts of the country it was uh, oak, uh, mainly oak beech, oak, it was you know, deciduous forest. Originally it was not a grassland, and so there is, by minimizing the amount of animals or needing pasture, we can start restoring that was lost in previous millennia and hundreds of years, if we choose so. We don't have to do it. I mean, it's our choices, aren't we? But I find the argument quite skewed. If we Europeans think that Brazilians are not allowed to cut their Amazonia because it's kind of heritage for the whole humanity, they look say, look at yourself. That's Ireland. Okay, you did it 500,000 years ago. By, but why what you did 5,000 years ago is not something that we cannot do today to improve our lives. You see the, the argument here, here, they want to have more development, so they, they want to use the resources for more production. And unless we also find some ways of restoring original habitat like forests in this continent, we can't really more or think point out fingers. And that's true for many European countries. But again, I'm sounding too much like activist now, <laughs> not like researcher. <laughs> I'm supposed to be like researcher, you know, not taking, I'm not taking sides. I'm thinking myself here, of sort of pondering on these issues. I'm not taking sides, but I'm, I see really a lot of value in animal production. And I will show you some examples of reasonably good one, uh, but I also see that the argument is being too, uh, well, too polarized. It's either no animals at all, or then as many as there are now, and we just improve management. That doesn't work. All, all the research that I've seen says that it, it won't work. And what is happening now, uh, again, livestock can be beneficial. I didn't have time to like make maybe this slide better for for for, for this particular occasion. But let's look at some positives of of say cows. You know, undoubtedly it's very high quality protein. I mean, it is all amino acids, 
plus iron plus B vitamin, it is very good food in, you know, normal amounts. <laughs> like salt is also good to have some salt. But how much of it? But yeah, I mean, it is high quality protein, undoubtedly so. Dairy products, if there were no cows here and milk, there will be no people in this part of the world. I mean, Finns, Finnish society is indebted a lot to a cow. And they're very good for nutrient cycling, of course, because they convert grass and then give food and then they give manure that can be then put into land again and improve fertility. Excellent. And then they allow for having grassland as part of rotation. Excellent. That's why cows were initially used as providers of manure above all. Fertility for arable land. And then uh, if we want them to utilize grass on non-arable land, it's usually through grazing because they can graze areas which you can't plow. Mokata. So anything like coastal meadow along the seashore or areas on forests, on bogs traditionally, that's where cows were. No people in their right mind would put a cow on a field. Field is for food. Cow is, can be elsewhere. And then they were grazing elsewhere and then bringing manure and fertility towards the field. Now it's all in reverse. And then the biodiversity, as I mentioned, that this, many of them are actually pastoral landscape. They're immensely biodiverse. But they need a grazing animal. And landscape or tradition, that's all with grazing systems. But these systems then are not as productive. They're not as intensive as currently. So now we go into the, this way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, water use, land use area. We intensify, intensify the production. And that comes at the expense of everything this. So like in southern Finland, there are no cows because here there is grain. So all the cows are in Pohyanma. But that means that many of from cows cannot come here anymore. And why would you have your grassland here in rotation if you can't have a cow grazing it or eating it? It doesn't make sense. So that's why we don't have any grassland now in southern Finland. And we have to use mineral fertilizers because many is there. So it's separated now. So the original use of animal is lost. And it's... So, so there are two ways. We either continue intensifying production and reducing greenhouse gas emissions on per kilo of product, or we just then make it more multifunctional. But that means there will be less of product. And that means we we'll probably have to eat less. But it's our choices. I don't say there's possibility in both of this, of course. But it can't be both. And um, now, this is a bit theoretical. Uh, I'm finishing now. So just to make it more <laughs> visual. Um, now, this is the modern dairy, like in France, that I visited. And sorry, picture is not very good now against the sun. But this is what it looks like. That there are cows that are milking in the boxes. And that's what in Finland is now. But in Finland, they're more closed. I'll show you. So and then they're young calves that are taken from them, they're in those cute, nice boxes beside. So they're not anything like this. And this is the picture when you approach the farm. It looks like this on the sign. You will never see this anymore. That's just an illusion. That's Those cows are separated from calves and they never see the pasture or grass under their feet because they're indoors. So it's more intensive, of course, it's more less more milk than and less greenhouse gas emissions per liter, but that's not the animal <laughs> that used to be or, uh, or is still advertised. And this is this high nature value farmland from Finland. Yes, and then you have biodiversity, you have field that cannot be plowed into the two rocks, they're too rocky and it's not very good fertility there, so cows can eat it. Uh, but then the production will be lower. You have other elements, landscape, biodiversity, heritage, what's not. But then there will be less milk or meat. 
and the the what what is going on now is that um under the name of uh, like improving environmental impact of animal production like dairy now we're going into this this is again more and more than dairy in finland but i've seen similar ones in many other countries in estonia france bulgaria so it's a big box like this this is a side this is a front so the, the animals are indoors they never go out it's a big like sludge liete not even manual and then the grassland which is very intensively managed it's for biodiversity it's very poor because there are three species of sown grass and then it's mowed very intensively and uh, and then what goes from that is just milk and then the calves that are then again all indoors grown for meat so there is no animal that is outside and grazing it's more in productive um but then it's not multifunctional and perhaps this is the way to go and so let's forget everything here let's make it even more productive but then natural uh, uh, logical conclusion is why to have the whole cow indoors why you know if we make it even more intensive and reduce the emissions and land use and other resources then why not to produce just meat cells that's even more efficient, much more efficient. And this is from Hanna Thomas to my colleague who calculated land use and carbon footprint and energy use. And there's beef, poultry, eggs, milk, peas, and then cultured meat and different other cell, you know, microorganisms, for example. And you will see it's dramatically different. So from the here, this is weak experimental farm, cows and doors. Um, instead of this, we'll just have indoors only muscle of cow. Does this make sense? I mean, it does make sense to me. Let's make choices. Either we have a multifunctional animal or then we have just very intensive production and we save a lot of land, we can restore forests. We can have wetlands again. Okay, let's skip something because I'm, yeah, I'm out of time. I'll have a few more minutes. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so you asked me to show this example, yeah? Mm. Okay, but here I have to say, this is a farm that I co-own. I have like Lechma Oyasa here. So don't think that I'm selling it to you. There are, ben there are pluses and minuses of this farm. I'm actually vegetarian myself, but now I ended up owning 300 cows. So 130 uh, mother cows, suckler cows, plus their calves. And it's beef cow cattle. It's used for beef, for meat. There's no milk, only meat. Um, and it, the farm makes me think about many things. Now, there's a good thing of this. Well, it's, it's fairly big for Finland, but it's by no means very like biggest. There's a lot of this high nature value pastures. I will show you an example. So we are the biggest, what you call it, perine biotopi in, hoitaja in the east of Usima. The biggest grazer manager of those traditional semi-natural high nature value grasslands. So we do have biodiversity, landscape, heritage, etc. You will see it now. But as I say, this is arable land and this is 300 animals. So it's Quite a lot of arable land is being used for that many animals. Now we're self-sufficient in all fodder, so we don't buy anything, but we don't sell all that much. So the whole land area on the farm largely is used just to produce beef. And that means we don't contribute directly to food for humans, because nearly all arable land is used back into cows. Well, some cereals are sold, but maybe 10% of cereals, 15. So if we want to be more sustainable, of course, we need to produce more, you know, oats and wheat and barley directly for human consumption. That will be a very good, efficient use of cows, of their manure. And that's the problem of most Finnish livestock farms. 
they have some cereal, but they use manure, but then it, they feed it back to the cows, not to people. And that doesn't make sense, environmentally wise. Um, just to show you the picture, so this is not very far from Porvo, this is the Picco Pernalacti, so it's a sea bay, it's an end of the bay, so it doesn't look like sea now, but <laughs> it ends here, so the, the, the river starts about here, Iloyoki. So the, there is a Natura 2000 area, so nature protected area, very important biologically, it's about here. So really important to keep it open. This like very also rare type of habitats on rocky places. And then the cows are all grazed along the coast. So on this side of the bay and then on that side of the bay. So it looks, as you can see, very messy. So there is green grass. This is cultivated field. This is natural. Nobody plows it, nobody seeds it, nobody fertilizes. So the cows create this very diverse, very biologically rich habitat. And it looks beautiful landscape-wise, I admit it. Uh, and that's why there are subsidies. There are some other benefits of it. And importantly, cows don't compete for food because this is these are fields. Cows are not on the field side. So they're all outside the fields. They're not eating up that. But unfortunately, in winter, we need to have silage winter for them. So indirectly, they're still eating our arable land. You see the point? And unfortunately, in Finland, it's it's difficult to do it other ways. So cows eat here in summer, and then winter, they have a lot of this arable land. So they also graze on the forests, which is uh, also rare habitat type for Finland now, these days. And I think I need to stop at this. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Uh, and actually, yes, this was it. Yeah. Do you have any questions? For so I kind of ended it. Um, selling my own farm. Well, that was not an intention. Intention. I just wanted to illustrate something that where cows can really be used in sensible way, but probably we could be even without that beef production, but because people do eat beef, my own sons eat. So where do you buy it? What kind of beef then? <laughs>